So Richard, you and I have known each other for a very long time, yeah. but for those that may be watching this and they obviously know the name Richard Saucedo, could you tell our audience a little bit about your background and how you came to be uh, in this space that you're in today? Sure, Scott. Um, great to be with you. And, uh, you know, I started, I was very lucky because my parents, for whatever reason, insisted um, that I start on a musical instrument and my dad decided it needed to be piano. And uh, that's kind of where everything started. And of course, like a lot of kids, I didn't want to practice. I didn't want to have anything to do with practice. Uh, but I started falling in love with playing. And at that point, started to fall in love with music. And then I just got really lucky because through beginning um, elementary school, middle school, high school, I had wonderful teachers and wonderful directors who um, just were great for me in terms of building my skills, uh, building my confidence as a musician, and they made me wanting to be a teacher. They made me want to be a teacher. So uh, that's how I came to be a band director, and I've just continued to be very lucky because I continue to get to work with some of the best people in our profession. Um, and, you know, writing for some of the best groups in the country, I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. Uh, marching bands, I, I'm doing some work for Hal Leonard as a composer, so doing a lot of concert band work too. Uh, in the drum corps realm, uh, doing a lot of work with drum corps too. So I'm just continue to meet a lot of great teachers and a lot of great mentors. And it sounds silly at my age, in my 60s, to talk about mentors. But I think at our age, we still need mentors. Yeah. And um, I've been lucky that my entire life I've been able to find them. And that's kind of why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Who was influential in your music journey as you started to discover composing and, and that side of things that you were doing? Well, I think, if I think back to when I started really composing, I was listening to some of the best writers at the time. I was listening to music uh, by Jay Bocook, uh, Mike Sweeney, and on the marching band side of things, um, uh, I, I was listening uh, to Wayne Downey's arrangements, who, who I'm fortunate to work with now uh, at Blue Devils. But uh, I, I just kept listening to those arrangements thinking, that is really cool stuff. <laughs> and so I started studying those scores. And I go back to Don Hoffman at Anderson High School because he allowed me to write when I was in high school. Uh, he wrote all our marching band music, which I thought was amazing. So I asked him to teach me. And over the course of three or four years, he just kept showing me how to do this. So he's a big reason that I'm um, writing today. And so I'm always going to be grateful to him. So when you were in college, was composition your major or were you a music ed major? Or? I, I never have taken a composition lesson in my life. Wow. Yeah. The, I, the only classes I've taken are music education classes. Um, and I do, didn't always pay attention well in those. You know, I'm still am in love with music education. think it's the greatest thing for kids ever. Um, and every day I see another reason that proves that when I work with kids. Um, but yeah, it's um, the, comp the composition thing. I never planned on being a composer that people would actually buy my music. I never planned on that. And when Hal Leonard offered me the opportunity to write, and I started writing marching band pieces, and people bought them, and then they asked me to do concert band stuff, and people actually paid to buy those, I was like, this is pretty cool. Uh, so I just continue doing it. You know, I'm never going to be what I call a real composer. I'm always going to be one of those wannabes, but I'm happy being a wannabe, you know, um, and I, I feel like I, I uh, serve a, a, a certain purpose out there uh, for directors. At least I hope I do. And uh, I'm going to continue to do that the best I can. Yeah, I don't know that I would call you a wannabe, but anyway, <laughs> <clears throat> so um, in your you know, schooling, you obviously played in the band through high school and you did continue in college. Did you do drum and bugle corps um, as a performer? I didn't. I um, started with the Cavaliers and was really excited because in high school I'd always been into drum and bugle corps and I had the opportunity to march with the Cavaliers right out of high school. But that was when I was getting ready to go to IU. And so I was with the Cavaliers, I want to say maybe a couple weeks or something and had learned the show and we were starting to perform and things were going great. Um, but then I found out that IU wasn't going to let me out of band camp. And if they weren't going to let me out of band camp, I couldn't do DCI finals. So I had to leave the Cavaliers, which was heartbreaking to me. We, we learned something recently about we did. Uh, 1976 when we, we did. both marched the Cavaliers for a part yeah. of the season, which was kind of funny. We did not know each other at that time, <laughs> yeah. but uh, that was great to learn. 
So um, when when you think about um, the groups that you've composed for and the pieces that you've written, um, there's pieces for me that come to mind. I mean, in the marching space, I think about those years that you were at the Cavaliers early on in the 2000s and kind of new doing original work like mm-hmm. Frameworks and the Samurai Show. Do you want to talk a little? What, what are things that um, the average person, teacher out there is going to know from the music that you've written? Well, I think, first of all, that was one of the, the best times in my life was working for the Cavaliers. I'm thinking the reason it was so cool is because DCI at that point, um, this may sound a little bold, but I think that my colleagues that worked back then would agree, DCI at that point was ready for a change. Um, It was ready for a different direction. And so we decided, let's go in the original music direction. And it wasn't that no one had ever done original music before. But we did it consistently for years, you know, and um, we were trying to, our goal was to come up with music that people would hum or sing going out of the stadium that they didn't, hadn't really heard before. Uh, so it was a great challenge, and I learned so much from doing that, but shows like Frameworks, Four Corners, um, to be able to just have a blank slate and have our visual folks say, here's kind of what we're thinking, and then just go, just sit at my computer and just go. Uh, things that I always wanted to write, um, mixed meter stuff that I always wanted to do on the marching field that the Cavaliers were willing to try, you know, things like that. So it was a, it was a great time in my life. Uh, another thing that I would never change. Besides the marching side of things, you obviously write a lot for the concert mm-hmm. space as well. And, and I know, you know, wind sprints is probably one of those pieces that everybody knows. What are a couple other pieces that come to mind as some of the things, maybe favorites that you've written over the years? Yeah, I would think uh, Snowcaps is another one that uh, is played a lot uh, by high schools, colleges. Uh, and uh, I'm starting to compose, like I did a um, first movement of a symphony that was uh, premiered at Midwest a few years ago. Uh, and then for younger bands, too. I'm, I'm really into writing for younger bands because as a teacher or a former band director, I know that people that are teaching middle school, people that are teaching the younger kids in high school need the right kind of literature for them. And so that's why I wrote pieces like Into the Clouds, uh, which is just a a very basic, like grade two and a half piece. Um, But I try to write pieces that have teaching concepts built into them. And that's another thing that I just love doing. And a lot of people are into writing the really, really hard stuff. And I like that sometimes too. But um, I really like presenting teachers with music that they can use to really solidify concepts with their kids. So I really enjoy doing that. Well, I mean, let's bump back to the teaching side of things. I mean, you taught for 31 years Mm -hmm. at Carmel before you retired and prior to that at a Mm -hmm. couple of other schools here in Indiana. Talk about that Carmel experience. I mean, that's, first of all, that's an amazing tenure. Um, But the things that you did with the program are Amazing. Well, I owe a lot. I, it's, it's hard to explain because um, when I came to Carmel, I had no idea what I was doing. You know, not that I do now, but I really had no idea back then. And so being around people like Ron Hellams, who was our choral director there, um, I was around great teachers at Carmel. And, um, you know, Tom Dick, the orchestra director, all these people that were really good and established, and I learned from them. They encouraged me to learn from other people. And so they kind of taught me how to learn how to teach. You write for a a number of decent Mm -hmm. programs around the country. (laughs) Who are those folks that you're writing for now? Well, you know, it's funny. I used to write for so many people, and I just can't do it anymore because of some of the other obligations I have. Uh, but I'm basically writing for groups around my area uh, and friends, writing for people that are great friends like Mike Pote, Chris Crakey at Carmel. Um, I, I write for Fishers High School, you know, for Chad and for Chris Descent uh, and uh, Brownsburg. You know, Chris Catholic, who's a former student of mine, uh, right for, for Hamilton Southeastern, those folks uh, being great friends of mine. So it's basically been bands around this area. I also write for two bands in Texas uh, that are just tremendous, uh, Klein Oak and Tumball Memorial. Uh, but I, I've really slowed down or I've really started to limit the number of bands I write for because I just don't have the time to do it the way I used to. 
Well, that's kind of a perfect segue to talk about the drum and bugle course you're involved with. Mm-hmm. So um, we talked about the two th- early 2000s when you were writing for the Cavaliers and um, couple, last year, the Blue Devils, you were involved with that. Talk a little bit about that and then we'll talk about your latest uh, foray. Well, it's um, being a part of DCI has been uh, an amazing part of my life and it's another area where I've just learned so much because there are so many great people there. Musicians, teachers, um, students, uh, staff members. Uh, But starting back with the Cavaliers, uh, I enjoyed that so much. But to think that when I'm in my 60s that I would be working with the Blue Devils, still kind of, I still have to look in the mirror every once in a while and just pinch myself. Um, Because it's an amazing group. Um, uh, Just a, a group that constantly strives to get to the next level not just for them but for the activity and so many great teachers and designers uh, etc and I was just so honored that they asked me to be a part of it and so I'm having a ball working with them and um, going to be um, kind of coordinating more things that they're going to be doing this next year so uh, I'm so excited and Nervous, too, because I don't know how we're going to top what we did last year, but um, I'm excited to try, as I know the whole staff is. That's awesome. And then I just heard the news that you're going back to the Cavaliers as well in some capacity. Yeah, for some reason, I believe in my heart that I can handle two drum corps. I, I'm, that may be pretty crazy, but basically I'm going to write uh, the brass book for the Cavaliers. And, you know, I'll, I'll be there occasionally to help and listen to what they're doing but my full-time position is still going to be at Blue Devils. But when the Cavaliers asked me, there was no way I could say no to them uh, because they jump-started my career. Uh, they're the reason, big reason you and I are sitting here talking right now. So uh, I wasn't going to say no to them, and I'm going to uh, try my best to, to, to do my best work for them. And I'm looking so forward to working. Great friends up there, Brett Kuhn, Mike McIntosh, uh, Cliff Walker, so many people uh, that I'm just really looking forward to working with at Cavaliers. Awesome. So let's talk about the pieces that you're working on right now. Are there new works that are due to come out? Are you working on commissions? What? Yes. As a matter of fact, I'm getting ready to start commissions. Um, I wish I had titles for you, but I don't right now. Uh, but over the next, uh, what is it, six or seven months, uh, there'll be five or six new pieces. Uh, I know that two of them are going to be lyrical pieces, um, the rest of them will be overture type pieces or um, more rhythmic, uh, but uh, a lot of them are for honor bands. A lot of them are for a couple of them are for community bands that are celebrating um, uh, high points in, in the careers of those bands. Um, so I'm I'm really looking forward to it. So we've talked a lot about marching band writing and the concert works. I know you write beyond the wind band. Are you doing? orchestral things as well? I have some orchestral pieces um, that I'm doing. As a matter of fact, right now I am working on a piece uh, for our good friend, Gary Markham, who unfortunately passed away uh, a few months ago. And so I'm writing a piece for the Kennesaw Mountain um, String Orchestra that they are going to perform at uh, their festival uh, this winter. And uh, so I'm very excited about being able to write uh, some orchestra pieces. And um, my good friend Sue Han, who we both know, who was uh, the orchestra director, director when I was at Carmel, um, gave me the opportunity to learn to write for orchestra. And so he's another, another person that I've got to thank because I will have, after this piece, I'll have five or six orchestra pieces on the market. And I'm just thrilled that people are doing them for all state orchestras. And um, I never thought that would happen. So I'm just really, really pleased. Is there a big difference between composing for the wind band and the orchestra? Yeah, wind band, I know about 75% about what I'm doing. Orchestra, I know about 25% of what I'm doing. So, yeah, that's the difference. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, we've, you talked about teaching and how important that is. I mean, you've left the teaching profession, but I know you and you haven't stopped teaching. Right. And, um, you know, how important is it, your your kids, your, your sons in the mm-hmm. Fisher's band right yeah. now, how is it? As a parent, what does that role look like for you? Um, it's it's exciting, uh, exhilarating. It's tough, you know, because um, I watch him at rehearsals because I, I do work with that program a little bit, and uh, I have to say, remember, you're. I have to tell myself, remember, 
you're a dad, you're not a director, you don't have to go out and correct him or whatever, but I'm really proud of him. He's doing great. He's had great teachers. Uh, the teachers at Fisher's have been wonderful. Uh, Marissa, his private teacher, has just been so great. Uh, the drum corps that I work with have been so welcoming to him, uh, and uh, he's just thrilled. You know, every time he's sitting on the couch here, most people are watching TV or whatever, he's watching drum corps videos, <laughs> you know, or watching drumline videos. And I'm thinking, it could be a lot worse, you know? Uh, so I'm really, really proud of him. So did you influence his decision to go into music? No, I really didn't. Um, I wanted him to, to try band, etc. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I kind of just let let it go on its own. And because of the great teachers that he had at the middle school in Fishers or the junior high, and now at the high school, he's just kind of fallen in love with it. And um, it's great to see his passion for that. Um, but I know he wants to be a percussion instructor, you know, so uh, he has the passion for that too. So I'm thrilled. You know, what what is it that you see in your kids, I mean, you have a couple of kids. Mm -hmm. What do you see in them that music has done in their lives? I mean, It's, it's made them better people. My daughter who teaches um, in elementary school right now is a tremendous teacher. And the reason she is is because she worked with tremendous teachers. She was at Carmel High School. She was under Ann Conrad for years uh, in the show choirs there and under Ron Helms, um, or, or I should say Lamont, Cusky, uh, and Ron Helms occasionally. Uh, but she had just amazing teachers. And so she learned from them how to be a great teacher. And so that affected them. Uh, Ethan, I think, is having some of the success he's having. He was lucky enough to... to uh, be put in the snare line as a sophomore at Fisher's High School, which just doesn't happen. Uh, and I think it's because um, of his, his teachers, Marissa, uh, the Fisher's folks, who have just constantly taught him about excellence and how to get there. So uh, I'm so proud of him. And proud of my daughter as well. Yeah, proud of both of them. Absolutely. Um, we appear in today's world to be losing a lot of teachers today. I mean, whether that's COVID-related or other things, I mean, what wisdom can you give teachers, young or old, um, as to how they can thrive in the profession like you have and others have? The problem with all of us, Scott, is that we can't do it without them. You know, these great teachers that are leaving, and I, I get it. You know, everybody gets tired. Everyone gets burnt out. COVID just ruined this for a lot of us. Um, a lot of my great friends stopped teaching during COVID because they just refused to teach to a computer screen. You know, and I, I understand that. And then they knew what was going to happen after COVID. They knew it was going to be tough for two or three years. And I think they were so disappointed um, after building great programs around the country. I think it was hard for them to hang in there. And I don't, I don't blame them. I understand because it's a very emotional thing, uh, what we do. But just hang in there is what I would say to teachers because we need you more than ever. We need those great music teachers more than ever. Uh, because what music does for kids um, and, and academic, are, you know, academics are so important. Uh, but what music does for kids is also important because it creates the total student. And we need those teachers. Those kids need those teachers. So I'm just begging them to hang in there. And, um, you know, if we all need to go to therapy once a week to get through it, then that's what we'll do. But um, we need to keep great teachers around our kids. Well, you've talked about the mentors you've had, but thank you for mentoring me and so many others in this profession. So thank you. Richard. Thanks, Scott.